Okay, hello and good evening, everyone. I'm so sorry for the delay. <laughs> We've been experiencing severe uh, Zoom difficulties. Our usual Zoom technician was unfortunately unable to help us this evening. So we've modeled through and hopefully we are now good to go. So welcome back to se Surgical Sessions and thank you for sticking with us through the brief bit of difficulty there. So this evening we're gonna be talking about uh, jaundice and HPB cancers, which I think is a very big and quite difficult topic. And although it seems hyper-specialist, actually on the surgical take, you'll see quite a few of these sort of cases coming in. Um, especially your sort of new diagnosis, pancreatic cancer is surprisingly common to see. So I think it's a good topic. It's a meaty topic. And without further ado, let's get stuck in. Uh, just to remind you about the, the course itself, you know, it's designed by tra junior trainees for junior trainees. Uh, it's no nonsense, just the core clinical info you're going to need to smash the job. As ever, we'll be going through with the same general format of the clerking, uh, a little bit about uh, the anatomy and pathology that's relevant to the cases, and we'll talk about specific diseases and their etiology. Because the presentation this week of HPV cancers can all be quite similar, we're then going to deal with investigations, management and complications sort of all together. And we're gonna be tying that up with some cases and some questions. So this is me again, hello. Those of you who were here the first week, uh, my name is Ben Turner. I'm an academic FY2 interested in hepatobiliary surgery, vascular research and teaching. So uh, this is a week I've been quite excited to talk about actually. Our key learning points really as a junior tra trainee are gonna be understanding the pathology of jaundice, knowing how to investigate it, and most importantly of all, how to bump it off to medics, if appropriate only. Uh, the initial management of patients presenting with jaundice and then how to apply these skills to some cases. So as we go through, just bear in mind, you're the surgical FY1 on take when you're referred an 81 year old female with type two diabetes, hypertension and congestive cardiac failure. She feels her skin's been becoming a little bit more yellow over the, over the past few days actually. And you can see she's glowing up there in the top left corner. Uh, she's also been having these intermittent rashes on the legs, arms and chest. And yes, those are her non-jaundiced hairy legs right there. Um, so I just, I really wondered what you guys thought about this. And I'm gonna see if I can see your comments if you type them in uh, under the video live stream. Um, so have a little think now, we'll open it up to the floor and let me see if I can see your comments. Okay, I'm really sorry. In the, in the interest of time, I think we're, we're actually gonna move on, but just thinking about some of those key history points that we, we talked about before, uh, you know, your key surgical questions of nausea and vomiting and the quality of those, any blood, things like that. Your abdominal pain and breaking that down into Socrates. I know no abdominal pain here, but it's always worth asking. Bowel habit is always gonna be really important, especially in the jaundice history. I uh, talked about any blood in there, the quality of the stool, you know, uh, any steatorrhea, whether it's pale, things like that. Your jaundice question is really key here. And what we haven't discussed there, the color of the urine and the color of the skin, and then any constitutional symptoms, weight loss, night sweats, etc. So continuing with our case, trying to work through. 
our, our lady has actually noticed some weight loss uh, in the last three months. That's about 10 kilos. It's unintentional weight loss. That's, that's quite significant. Um, she's also had this persistent feeling of nausea on and off for about a month uh, with occasional vomiting. Urine's very dark, stools are pale. Uh, she's itchy uh, and it's stopping her sleeping as well. But the bowel habit is otherwise normal, same regularity. Um, and she's got some sort of vague background abdominal pain. So bearing all of that in mind and thinking about hepatobiliary in general, it's, it seems complicated when you look at it from the outside, but it's actually just a remarkably similar a uh, compilation of tubes and hollow organs, really. So obviously you've got your common bile duct, and that is formed from the union of the cystic duct and the common hepatic ducts. Now, if you see up here, uh, you've got the left and the right hepatic ducts, you've got your gallbladder here, and then you've got your pancreatic duct joining the common bile ducts uh, and then you've got the ampulla of Barta just there opening out into the small intestine. So uh, this diagram is the only thing you're actually dealing with in HPB and any pathology is going to be originating around here and, and, and causing one of these things to, causing difficulty with one of these things. So this is another diagram that's slightly more anatomically correct. Um, and you can see actually that the common bile duct is there running in the lesser omentum. And you've got your triad of the common bile duct, the inferior vena cava, and the, and the aorta all running there. Um, and here again, we can see, sorry, not the aorta, the hepatic artery that was. And here we can see the vascular anatomy of the uh, hepatic biliary system. Uh, so that you've got your celiac axis splitting up there into the left gastric, the splenic, and the uh, major hepatic arteries. And we can leave it there for just now in terms of vascular anatomy for time. So the way bilirubin is actually formed is the breakdown of hemoglobin from red blood cells. And that occurs both in the spleen and the liver in macrophagia derivative cells. And they break down the hemoglobin into heme and bilverdin. And the, this then forms the unconjugated bilirubin which will be transported to the liver where it's taken up by hepatocytes. And it's then conjugated from insoluble bilirubin into a soluble form of bilirubin by UDP glucuronase. Uh, and, and that gives you that conjugated bilirubin. Now, it's important to note that the unconjugated bilirubin is insoluble and that the conjugated bilirubin is soluble. And we'll deal with that a little bit later in one of our cases. Um, so this is just a little bit about the enterohepatic circulation and how, because conjugated bilirubin is soluble, it can then be excreted in the bile. And once the bile makes its way into the gastrointestinal tract, bacteria converts conjugated bilirubin into something called urobilinogen and stercobilin. Now those two are excreted and they are the pigment in both urine and feces. So when we're thinking about jaundice, it really all comes down to whether the, the bilirubin is being produced from before the liver, in the liver, or after the liver. And we can break those down into our prehepatic, hepatic and post-hepatic causes. Uh, increased levels of unconjugated bilirubin, i.e. before the bilirubin has been conjugated in the liver, well, they're going to be your things that increase the breakdown of the red blood cells that we were talking about. So that might be hemolysis, and you can get all your random hemolytic anemias, but it also might be something a bit more subtle, like abdominal wall hematomas that are being broken down. And 
if you've got a significant size hematoma, you can actually get quite a, quite a big raise in your bilirubin because of that. Hepatic causes, that's going to be effectively any cirrhosis, any liver parenchymal damage. Um, so it could be acute hepatitis, uh, it could be a chronic cause such as uh, alcoholic hepatitis or cirrhosis secondary to alcohol. In surgery, the causes that we're mainly going to be looking at are the post-hepatic ones, and that's when there's blockage of bile outflow, and that will give you a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Um, so, for example, that could be something like a common bile that's stone that, that blocks that outflow from the liver and leads to a backup of the conjugated bilirubin, and that's the only way you need to think about it. So I just thought with the causes of post-hepatic jaundice, you know, there are, there are an innumerable number of things that it could be, but if we think about the, the tube itself and the common bile duct, then we can really come up with some causes quite easily. And this is a, a useful way of thinking because it can be applied to pretty much all tubes within medicine. And I mean, that's one of the main things that surgery deals with is tubes. So if this is our tube here, we can call it the common bile duct, or if we we're doing something else, we could call it an artery or a vein. It doesn't really matter. It, the, the, uh, the way to break down the, the causes of obstruction are all the same. So you can have an intraluminal obstruction. You can have an obstruction that grows from the wall of the tube itself, and we call that a mural obstruction. And then you can have an extramural obstruction or something that pushes from the outside and uh, compresses the tube that way. So those are, are broadly our classes of, uh, well, there are differential diagnoses for post-hepatic causes of jaundice. So now going back to our case of our 81-year-old female who now has jaundice, weight loss and rash and a bit of nausea. So you examine her now and you find scleral icterus and jaundice, as we've discussed. Uh, you don't find any stigmata of chronic liver disease and she's got excoriations all over her body. The abdomen is soft and she's Murphy's sign negative. Now, important to check the Murphy's sign because of acute cholecystitis and the association with gallstones and jaundice, etc. We're going to be dealing with gallstone disease uh, in its entirety next week, in fact. BOAS sign is, a, is another sign of acute cholecystitis, scapular pain, and that's negative. But the Courvoisier sign is positive. And that Courvoisier's law is something that says, in the presence of jaundice with a painless, palpable gallbladder, the cause of the jaundice is unlikely to be benign. So, so that's a bit of a clue. And I'm really sorry if I could see your guys' answers. I, I'd love to involve you at this stage, but I just want you to have a think about uh, your differential diagnosis. And you see how close you were. So the HPB malignancies that we're gonna be dealing with today are pancreatic cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, liver metastases and as well. So I, as I was referring to, they can all present in quite similar ways. We're not gonna focus so much on the presentation, but we're gonna focus on key things for the history, such as risk factors, and then any specifics about their presentation for that condition. So for pancreatic cancer, 90% of them are going to be a bog standard pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Major risk factors for this are type 2 diabetes, smoking, obesity, and alcohol abuse as well. Type 2 diabetes and alcohol abuse, these are both for the same reason, really, is that the, the diabetes and the alcohol both can cause uh, recurrent pancreatic inflammation over time. Now, with any cancer, one of the major risk factors is chronic inflammation. And so that explains why they're noted down here. Presentation-wise, uh, one of the presentations, if you block the pancreatic duct, those pancreatic secretions become trapped within the pancreas. 
and the autolytic enzymes can begin their, their process of breaking down memories. And that's, this can lead to an acute and very severe pancreatitis. Uh, another thing we've got noted down here is Trousseau syndrome, which is also known as thrombophlebitis migrans. And this is not only associated with pancreatic cancer, but it is one of the main cancers that causes it. And this is, as the thrombophlebitis migrans suggests, it's a migratory inflammation of superficial veins. And that explains Our Lady from Earlier's uh, patchy rash that was appearing on her arms, on her legs, on her chest, quite atypical uh, locations for thrombophlebitis to occur. Metastases, you're chiefly looking at local invasions with an aggressive cancer such as pancreatic cancer, um, local lymph nodes, um, and it could not only, you can't, you can have a uh, head of pancreas tumor that can obstruct the common bile duct via extramural compression, but you can also have direct invasion uh, into the duct. You can have um, metastases to the porter hepatis nodes, and those can cause air compression of um, the ducts higher up. And, and so it, it's known as a, a very aggressive cancer uh, that that unfortunately doesn't have a very good five-year survival as with quite a lot of the hepatobiliary malignancies. Our next one to discuss is cholangiocarcinoma. So this is gonna be a mural adenocarcinoma. And the chief risk factors, again, are, are things that cause chronic inflammation over time. So in the West, ulcerative colitis and PSC are both associated with this. Uh, because uh, because of the because ulcerative colitis and PSC are highly linked in their presentation, uh, that explains why they're both there together. Um, PSC is generally extrahepatic sclerosis of um, of bile ducts, and so any inflammation there builds up over time. You can also get intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, um, and so. For that reason, hepatitis can be a risk factor for phangiocarcinoma, as well as any other cirrhosis, any other form of uh, ongoing liver inflammation. Uh, being Southeast Asian is, or from a Southeast Asian country rather, is of increased risk of phangiocarcinoma, and that's because of the association uh, with liver flukes and other liver parasites uh, that is of higher prevalence out there. Uh, presentation, you can easily present with cholangitis and biliary sepsis, and this cancer especially has a very rapid progression. Average time of survival from diagnosis is six months. Um, so, you know, very, very rapid progression. And again, you've got your same thing with the local invasion, but you can also get invasion of the portal vein uh, and the liver. And even with surgery, five-year survival is still quite poor. Liver metastases, these are actually 20 times more common than any of the liver primaries combined that we've been talking about today. Um, and your main one is gonna be colorectal cancer. And that is because in our diagram on the right here, we can see the drainage of the, uh, of the colon and uh, small intestine. And you can see that they both drain into the portal vein and therefore any metastases that are being shed are likely to go straight to the liver via the portal vein. Um, so your main one is colorectal cancer, but you can, there will be metastases to the liver from any organ that is drained by the portal system. So that includes the esophagus and the stomach. Um, and generally you will, if you're diagnosed with colorectal cancer, you will have a CT chest abdo pelvis. And during that uh, CT, they may discover that there is a synchronous metastasis, i.e. one that is existing at the same time as the diagnosis of colorectal cancer. There's about a 5% rate of that. There's also a 5% rate of metachronous metastases. And these are mets that occur within six months of the diagnosis of colorectal cancer. 
Um, so it's an important consideration when you're dealing with this disease. And it's quite good news with this one, really. Survival for a, a Duke's D cancer, i.e. distance metastasis, used to be quoted as 5% and uh, with resection of liver met up to 25% over five years. But with modern technique, techniques and checking for R0 resection, i.e. no cells at a microscopic level in the resection, uh, their, their survival has improved to as much as 50 to 60% in some centers. So that's a, an amazing surgical outcome. I just thought I'd talk briefly about gallbladder polyps, not that, not that it's a malignancy clearly, uh, but these are really very common when they're diagnosed in the general population. So 30% of the population are known to have gallstones and 5% will have a concurrent uh, gallbladder polyp. Now these rarely cause any issues because they're normally very small. They're normally less than one centimeter and guidance is currently changing, but if they are less than one centimeter, they can be left in situ. If they're greater than one centimeter, they really need a cholecystectomy. Uh, these can occasionally cause some issues with, they can present as biliary colic and cholecystitis, uh, but generally they're asymptomatic and overall don't need to have anything done about them. So if a panicked, uh, if a panicked radiographer calls you or, uh, or radiologist lets you know, you can just bear that in mind. Hepatocellular carcinoma. So most hepatocellular carcinomas are caused by um, hepatitis, but most cirrhosis is caused by alcohol. Now, cirrhosis is the main risk factor for hepatitis, and so it doesn't really follow. Um, but it's just interesting to note that the obviously the degree of inflammation that you get from uh, hepatitis B and C virus uh, has, a, has a differential effect. So on the right in the diagram, you can see uh, a very cirrhotic liver. You can see it, it's nodular and fibrosed. And in the sort of yellowy color there, probably because it's associated with some bile leak, uh, you can see a hepatocellular carcinoma. So your risk factors are cirrhosis, viruses, alcohol, your iron and copper, um, storage diseases, uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and type two diabetes as well. Uh, so these are gonna present largely in the same way, but they may present with more of a cirrhotic picture. They may have these signs of chronic liver disease. Uh, you might notice a nodular hepatomegaly on examination and you may get more of a hepatic jaundice so not the same predilection for conjugated bilirubin and you may have a, more of a more of a transaminitis uh, more of a rise in your alt and your ast than your alp um, and i've just noted down here about the milan criteria those are those are the criteria to decide whether or not a hepatocellular carcinoma is operable um, you can always look those up in your own time if you'd like. So as with every week, we'll go through the investigations that you need to order when you're seeing these kind of patients with this similar presentation on the surgical take. Uh, and that will start with the bedside investigations, then the bloods, and then the radiology. So bedside, uh, they're more or less the same every time. You know, everyone needs an admission ECG. Not necessarily for us as the surgeons, but because the anaesthetist is going to have to see that before anyone goes to theatre. And similarly, anyone who goes to theatre needs their lateral flow and their COVID PCR. Urine dip in this case could be quite interested, interesting when you're looking at jaundice because you're considering conjugated versus unconjugated bilirubinemias. So unconjugated bilirubin, as we said, is is insoluble and therefore it will not be secreted in the urine. So on your standard urine dipstick, for which you do get a, a test for bilirubin, if you see that there's a raised bili, you'll know that this is a conjugated bilirubinemia and it leads you, a uh, bilirubinuria, sorry, and this leads you away from a prehepatic cause and more towards a, a hepatic or post-hepatic cause. 
and as, as with any, every surgical patient everyone needs it, a urine pregnancy test. So I've got here the panel of, of standard blood tests that we do for all surgical patients. But on the next page here, I've got specific liver screen ones. Now, this is something that lots of surgeons might not know about, but it's quite a good way to, to distinguish both the cause of your biliary anemia and to rule out any other medical causes, be they concurrent or the actual cause. Um, so talking about your LFTs, raised ALP versus raised ALT. So if you have a higher ALT than ALP, generally, this indicates that it's gonna be some kind of hepatocyte problem, i.e. it's a hepatic cause of jaundice. Whereas if you're looking at the ALP and that's uh, distinctly raised, the ALP is more in the biliary tree and therefore if that's raised, it indicates a, a post-hepatic problem. Similarly, you can use the split bilirubin, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, conjugated versus unconjugated ratio. And that gives you vital information on whether it's a prehepatic versus hepatic or post-hepatic cause. Uh, within your liver screen, there should always be a viral screen for hepatitis B, C, as well as HIV because of its association with those two viruses, uh, cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus. You want to check the alpha-1 antitrypsin levels and the if you're thinking malignancy, you should always check the, the serum AFP. And we, we could consider the... Um, CA199 though there as well, even though it's not, uh, it's not backed by NICE anymore because it, it doesn't have any prognostic value. Uh, the serum caruloplasmin, the clotting is an indicator of the synthetic function of the liver. So, that, so if your clotting function goes off, it means your liver isn't producing all your clotting factors and it's a really good indication of liver health as is albumin. Uh, gamma GT goes with the alkaline phosphatase, the ALP, for uh, indicating more of a biliary tree uh, pathology than a intrinsic liver pathology. And then all of these presentations, you can check the anchor and ANA if nothing else is coming up positive. Investigations to consider in, in jaundice. Everyone should have an ultrasound abdomen unless you're going straight to something like a CT abdomen and pelvis. And really this is going to depend on how unwell your patient is, their age, et cetera, et cetera. If you're suspecting something like gallstones, it's best to wait for the ultrasound abdomen um, or you can go directly for something like an MRCP if you're feeling very brave. Uh, but CT abdomen and pelvis, if there's a history of weight loss or abdominal pain or the patient is peritonitic, things like that, then you need to go straight in with a rapid investigation because it's very quick to get a CT abdo pelvis done, but it's not quick to get an ultrasound abdomen done. Um, Follow-up investigations that you may need after your CT abdomen pelvis that has shown a hepatobiliary mass, uh, well, you're always going to need a CT chest abdomen and pelvis uh, to rule out any concurrent metastases. Um, they may well ask for a CT triple phase of either the liver or the pancreas, depending on which HVB malignancy you're talking about. And that's because when you inject the contrast, certain lesions enhance in typical ways, uh, to summarize that. So from the, from the radiology, they can tell more likely what the cancer is without having to do a biopsy. Um, and then for gallstone pathology, the gold standard diagnosis is MRCP. Um, and for looking directly at liver pathology, MR liver is the best investigation. So after all that, what we're really left with are our key assessment points for going through jaundice, are your jaundice history and the, the pattern of when it's come on, any associated symptoms, then you're gonna specifically be looking at your pattern of liver function tests. 
um, whether there's a raised ALP, where the hyperbilirubinemia is coming from, et cetera, et cetera, and any, any liver screening results that you get back. And then it, it's mostly going to be your imaging that tells you the most likely definitive diagnosis. So when, when to escalate with jaundice? Well, anyone that's presenting cholangitic, i.e. Charcot's triad of jaundice, right upper quadrant pain and uh, fever. Anyone presenting with those symptoms, uh, you urgently need to escalate to your registrar. Um, Reynolds Pentad is just, it refers to hypotension as well as confusion on top of Charcot's triad. And it's, it's really important with HPV cancers because you get stasis of bile, this causes uh, an accumulation of gram-negative bacteria. Now, gram-negative bacteria, when they get into the bloodstream and cause a bacteremia, this dramatically drops the blood pressure because of the presence of LPS in the cell wall. So these patients, they can become acutely unwell extremely quickly, um, and they may well need inotropic support uh, to, to support the blood pressure. So it's critical that if the patient is spiking, they've got abdominal pain as well, that you escalate early to your registrar and take, and in fact, you get them to come and see the patient because this, this person may need urgent ERCP, urgent surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Certainly they need urgent antibiotics. Uh, similarly, biliary peritonitis is a, is a foul and nasty complication of surgeries, but can also happen spontaneously with some of these malignancies. So uh, it is critical that if someone is peritonitic as ever to escalate to your registrar. So going through the pillars of management globally for patients with HPV malignancy. The conservative measures that really, these are the key things that you can be doing as the surgical junior on the ward. Um, and that is treating the symptoms that can be awful, such as nausea and vomiting. Um, and I've just given some suggestions of what you could use here. Um, often patients, uh, because with things like pancreatic cancer, you can get invasion of the celiac nerve plexus. It can cause intractable nausea and vomiting. So it's important to, it's a horrible and unpleasant symptom and it, it's important to maximize uh, antiemetic cover early on for these patients, just simply for their quality of life. Uh, similarly, for itching can be a, an intractable symptom and you can help with this with chlorphenamine, which is useful because it's a drowsy antihistamine as well. And so it can help with sleep. And there's also some, something called calamine lotion, uh, which is a cooling lotion that can be stored in the fridge and takes away some of that surface itch. Pain as ever, you know, basic things. You can control this with your WHO uh, pain ladder, starting with paracetamol, going up to something in surgery like tramadol if they're getting quite bad pain. That's something you can titrate up and convert into stronger opiates quite easily if you need to. Weight loss, this is gonna be if you're thinking about weight loss in these patients and optimizing them for surgery, you know, that's, that's super good stuff. And uh, the way to do that really is, is to get a nutrition history um, involving the dietitian for any nutritional supports. And then you can think uh, later down the line, admittedly, but you can think about um, enteral or parenteral support for the nutrition. Uh, and all of these things you're going to be doing, are, they're really optimizing the patient's quality of life here. Medical things that need to be done urgently, if there's any indication of sepsis, and that will be your two of your SERS criteria, uh, plus minus a, a diagnosed bacteremia, um, then you, you must cover for gram negatives. And normally this will be something like gentamicin or amicacin. Um, and then you add in additional gram positive color, uh, cover because your coliforms are like the third and fourth most likely candidates in biliary sepsis. Your main ones are E. coli and Klebsiella. 
Um, and with the with treating the sepsis, as we were referring to earlier, you, you need to make sure you've got IV fluids going. You need to make sure you're supporting that blood pressure, keeping the MAP above 70. Um, early ITU input is, is super important for these patients because they can deteriorate so quickly. And I was reading a study today about how those that developed uh, septic shock for biliary sepsis in, a, in one case series, 100% uh, died within 48 hours. So it, it shows you the severity of developing septic shock in these patients, and you don't want it to, you don't want it to take that long. Because, uh, because of the jaundice, you can develop problems with clotting. And in order to reverse these, you can give vitamin K 10 milligrams IV for three days. This is a standard protocol that's done before ERCP to minimize bleeding problems when performing sphincterotomy. And whilst we're thinking about the patient's bleeding, we also have to think about the risk of them clotting. Now we were talking about pancreatic cancer earlier and the association with thrombophlebitis migrans, which is a effectively movable blood clots uh, that are establishing around the body. Um, in any cancer patient, you really need to think about the risk versus benefit of clotting and, um, and bleeding. So this is definitely something to discuss with your reg, which suggests that most people should actually be on low molecular weight heparin. Um, that can be held the day before a procedure. Um, and your surgical interventions. Now, just it obviously depends on the HPV malignancy that you're treating here, but I just thought I'd discuss some of the core principles that we're thinking about when performing an intervention for one of these cancers. So surgery, while a patient is jaundice, does lead to bad outcomes, okay? That has been proven in the literature and is something that we have to bear in mind. So ideally, we are gonna be reducing or eliminating the jaundice before operating on patients. Fluid stasis in any closed system in the body leads to sepsis because you get translocation of bacteria and they infect the static fluid. So for example, a pancreatic head tumor that is pressing the common bile duct and causing bile stasis, that is likely to lead to sepsis. And this means it's urgent that we treat, uh, that we treat the reason for the blockage. As a general principle, if it's blocked, you know, it's simple stuff. We're gonna try and open it up. And similarly, if it's in a good spot to take it out, we're gonna try and take it out. So those are the main things that we're thinking about when we consider these investigations. So our first port of call in acute jaundice with a proven post-hepatic cause is to try and do ERCP, which stands for endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. So scope goes down the throat, uh, find, the, um, find the ampulla of Varta, perform a sphincterotomy, uh, and then enter with a side camera to try and relieve said obstruction by placing a stent. Now you can see here that uh, the reason for this obstruction is a little stone there in the common bile duct. Um, so that is how ERCP works. And that's gonna be our first port of call because it's the easiest option. It's actually the least invasive option and it's the quickest way to, uh, to hopefully rectify the jaundice. If ERCP is unsuccessful, then we can consider something called percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography. And that involves going through the skin and through the liver and placing a stent, usually straight into one of the hepatic ducts or both. Now, the advantage of this is that if you've got such a tight narrowing that you can't pass the stent at ERCP and that you can't drain the obstruction, 
this is a guaranteed way to drain the flow of bile and it's direct from the liver. And you can see here that it, the, everything is very dilated uh, before the narrowing of the bile duct. So that's a long segment of stricture there and everything is very dilated. Now PTC can only be done once everything is very dilated. And that means that you've had a little bit of pressure in the system for a while. So that's its disadvantage along with the fact that you can develop hemorrhage, hematoma, and the stents themselves can block or fall out. Um, so that is PTC. For um, small hepatocellular carcinomas and for uh, isolated colorectal cancer metastases, you can do something called a wedge resection of the liver, which is where you go in with an ultrasound instrument and you buzz through the small bile ducts and the small vessels, closing them off as you go and you then remove your wedge of liver. It's as simple as that. And you will uh, analyze the margins of your resected sample and um, check for your R0, R1 resection. And finally, moving on to the, the proper surgery here, you've got your Whipple's procedure or pancreaticoduodenectomy. Um, and this is going to be for things like your pancreatic head tumor that is compressing the bile duct. And these can only be done in certain circumstances, which we're not going into, but it really is major surgery. And so you can see that they remove the pancreatic head and part of the body there. Uh, they remove a section of common bile duct as well as the gallbladder and uh, the parts of the duodenum that the pancreatic cancer is likely to have locally invaded. And then you perform a pancreatico jejunostomy uh, and a colodoco jejunostomy, which is the bile duct uh, being anastomosed to the jejunum. Um, and then you also perform astro jejunostomy to ensure that the stomach has somewhere to drain to and it's not a blind ended loop. So those are your major interventions. The complications we're gonna we're gonna skim over briefly because there are so many. But you you know if you're if you're fiddling with anything in surgery, you can have a complication from it. So if you're fiddling with the pancreatic ducts, you can have pancreatic duct leaks and pancreatic fistulae from that because of the lytic enzymes. If you experience the blocked stent. Uh, then that can be a real issue with things like uh, PTC, uh, where you don't have many other options except to replace the stent. And you can imagine every time you replace the stent, you can do more and more damage to the liver, which then leads to hemorrhage, because the liver is a very vascular organ. And also when you're doing your vascular anastomosis, uh, then you can have hemorrhage there. Uh, ascending cholangitis, if the ducts become blocked again because of, for example, a, a post-operative stricture, um, that can be quite a common cause of uh, cholangitis. Hemorrhage again, because it's so important. Um, and you can also have bile leak from your uh, cholidoka duodenostomy. So to finish off, we've just got a few questions and uh, I'm going to struggle to see your guys' answers because my, um, my feed for the live video, unfortunately, isn't loading. Really sorry about that. But I'm going to give you sort of 30 seconds on each question, and uh, I'll read them out to you as well. And I just want you to think, based on, based on what we've gone through today, what you think would the, the, most, uh, the most appropriate answers would be. So... Our first question here is uh, a 52 year old gentleman, John, this is referred to you on take. Um, he has no background uh, or he has no background at all and no abdominal pain. What's the most useful blood test going to be to rule out surgical cause here? So you can pick from the clotting, split bilirubin, ALT, ALP or the AST.
Okay, so the answer here is probably going to be the split bilirubin because if it shows very high levels of unconjugated bilirubin, then you know that your cause is from an excess of red cell breakdown. And we're not even going to think about what those might be. We just know that they're not surgery. Um, question two, which of these is a cause of post-hepatic jaundice? So non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hepatitis, uh, alcohol abuse, hemolysis, or a common bile duct stone. Okay, so the answer there is going to be a common bile duct stone. Question three, uh, which hepatobiliary cancer is most commonly associated with diabetes? So your options are cholangiocarcinoma, liver metastases, hepatocellular carcinoma, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, or gallbladder adenocarcinoma. Okay, and your answer here is going to be pancreatic adenocarcinoma. On to question four, as a 54 year old lady presents with a D2 adenocarcinoma and peritoneal METs. She develops biliary sepsis due to compression of the ampulla avata from this D2 adenocarcinoma. Unfortunately, ERCP was unable to pass a stent due to uh, due to blockage, what is the best intervention to do next? So should we do the ERCP again? Should we do an MRCP to delineate the anatomy? Should we do a, a PTC, a Whipple procedure, or, or a sphincterotomy? And so the answer here is going to be a PTC, and that's because we've already failed the ERCP. So we need to we need to drain that system. And repeating an ERCP is unlikely to be successful. Uh, they will have already performed a sphincterostomy the first time when they were going to when they're going to try and enter. Question five: An 82-year-old lady, our 82-year-old lady, we were talking about earlier, with palliative pancreatic adenocarcinoma. She develops extreme itching and she can't sleep because of that. Her, her bilirubin level is above 500 now. What medical therapies could we give her in order to improve her symptoms? So you can choose between permethrin cream, carlamine, hydrocortisone, ranitidine, or chlorphenamine, and you, and you can pick two of these. Okay, and the answers are carlamine lotion and chlorphenamine. Um, so this is a, another shameless plug for our free weekly surgical webinars. Uh, you can sign up to receive a notification about them every week, and you can sign up to get the uh, to get the Facebook links for every week. Uh, we're always giving out certificates for attendance, uh, you just need to fill in the, the feedback survey after each session. Um, and all of the sessions are available on YouTube on the Mind the Bleep channel as well as that. So I'm gonna actually now hand over to one of our sponsors from the BMA. Um, and he's gonna chat to you a little bit about the role of the BMA. And I will leave the feedback questionnaire uh, the, the QR code to the feedback, I'll leave it up on the screen just here so that you guys can scan that and leave some feedback.
session and get your certificates. Next week, we'll be covering gallstones. And thanks very much for bearing with us with the technical difficulties today. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. So, sorry, I'm just trying to share my screen. Sorry about this. Terminable. This bit. Um, there you go. I'll check some links in there. Um, yeah. Uh, I can't share my screen while the other participant is sharing. Sorry, Ben. I've stopped sharing for you. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, you should be able to see that now. Uh, so yeah, thanks, thanks, Ben. Um, thanks, and and uh, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry if you've seen my talk before. Um, please, please stay. Um, I, I'll only be, I'll be very, very quick. Um, I've, I've. But there's there's a QR code on screen. Um, I've shared some uh, links that are hopefully going to be re reposted on um, on Facebook and in, in the comments. Um, so yeah, so so basically, um, we usually have some free stuff for you when we see you in person. So obviously, we can't we're not seeing you in person at the moment. Um, so so yeah, just it was just a different way of uh, giving you guys uh, something free. I'll turn my video on so you can see what it like. Um, so uh, yeah, before we start, um, if, if you wanted to get a sort of a free support pack, free uh, employment guide, like junior doctor employment guide, um, just scan that QR code. Uh, it's it's something that that, that we've created here, at the BMA. Um, so yeah, it's got everything. It's got uh, the employment guide for, for juniors. As I guess some of you are juniors here on 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 this on this meeting today. Um, it's also got our ethics toolkit, uh, revision, some revision tips and tricks, um, looking after yourself at med school, and there's a Q and A with uh, Dr. Alex George there. Um, really, really good resource is completely free so it doesn't matter if you're a member or not um just completely free it's just a way of us giving you something and also means that we, we can stay in touch with you so yeah use that qr code um it's in the top corner as well just while i'm speaking so do it anytime um uh you can listen to me and sort of half do it this is fine um <laughs> So yeah, just a little bit about BMA membership. Uh, I'm sure you're members or you've been a member at some point. Um, so you know about what we do, what the BMA is and what you sort of get as a member. So yeah, just a little refresher. Um, and again, you may, you may have seen uh, my talk before, uh, Mind the Bleep, uh, but if not, um, do, do stay, do stay and listen. Um, so yeah, we're the trade union for doctors and med students in the UK. Uh, we act as a voice of the profession, so we represent you uh, individually, locally and nationally on all the issues that affect you. Um, so we've recently uh, done a survey. Um, obviously, there was the, uh, the, the agreed um, pay uplift that, let's face it, none of us uh, agree with. Um, so yeah, we've done a survey just to clarify that we don't agree with it. Um, and we'll be coming out with sort of next steps as to what we're going to do, whether it's uh, I shouldn't say the word, but industrial action or, or, or whatever it is next, uh, next steps that we take. So yeah, keep an eye on that. Um, and, and yeah, we'll be in touch with everyone about what we're going to be, what we're all going to be doing. Um, so yeah, we're not, we're not an indemnity company. So we, we get sometimes get confused with MDU and MPS. Um, so we don't deal with patient complaints. Uh, we're here to solely look after you, uh, your development, your working conditions. So, so, so things like pay, uh, your contracts, your wellbeing. So we negotiated the the, all the contracts, the junior contracts, consultant contracts, that's sort of where, where what we do. Um, so yeah, so if you're a membership, uh, we can give you advice and support and um, whenever you need it and whatever you need. Um, so yeah, we understand the sort of things you, you encounter uh, in medical school and, and also as, as a junior. Um, so yeah, it's all about just giving you advice. We have, um, we have employment advisors based at every medical school. We have employment advisors based at every trust. We have industrial relations officers based at every trust, so, so on the ground. So there's people that you can see, there's people that know um, the staff that they, they need to know to, to get things sorted. So yeah, uh, come, come to us if, if there's anything you need, you need uh, if there's any support you need. Um, so again, not just med school, but but as, as and when you pass pass on and be, be, be an F1, be an F2, etc. cetera. Um, so as a member, you also get access to uh, the BMJ. So, so if you're a final year, you get the, the BMJ actually come through the post. Uh, every week so that's the actual journal uh if you're if you're already a member and you're not getting that just make sure you give us a call and just say that i'm my final year now uh, i would like i would like to get it weekly and then we'll send you it. it's no extra money um also you can read every single uh, copy on the bmj app so if you download the app and log in using your bma uh, credentials uh, you'll be able to read old and new copies um 
so yeah, you, you can also opt out if you're on final year of, of getting the paper version. I get them every week, and sometimes it's a bit much. I, I must admit, I, I don't get a chance to, to read them all. Um, so yeah, also being a member uh, it means you have access to our clinical, non-clinical learning tools. So you've got full access to BMJ Learning. Uh, so yeah, over a thousand, over a thousand modules on there. It's all very interactive and obviously kept up to date uh, uh, with with practice change developments. Uh, all sort of uh, simulated environments uh, and and for each module we do you can get sort of a proof of learning with a certificate uh, if, if required you when you when you're a junior so uh, bma library has thousands of thousands of ebooks e uh, e and, and journals um it's not currently open uh, physically um so yeah so so sort of just all the all the books and journals that are online at the moment uh we've got a new tool called uh, clinical key so you may have used it before so so we've now acquired that so it's now part of bma membership so essentially uh, it's it's a it's a it's a um, it's a search engine um, where you can search conditions guidelines um, gives you drug, drug monographs and and the step by step procedure videos it. really really cool tool and yeah you can use it on your phone or laptop great thing to to have in your pocket uh, if you're thinking about your specialty options already um, you, you may you may uh, you may have, maybe you've even heard of this before um, but our specialty explorer tool is a really good really good tool for that so it's an online psychometric test which takes about 20 minutes to complete um, it'll ask you all sorts of work like balance questions uh, then it'll give you a detailed report listing sort of the suit specialties uh, according to the answer you've given so it's really easy to use um, and covers all specialties and, and the reports are always really uh, thorough so uh, if any time uh, you feel you'd like to speak to someone about your, your well-being, uh, our services are open 24-7 to all students and doctors, and you'll have the choice of either speaking to a counsellor or, or a peer support doctor. So this one's a telephone-based service, um, and we do offer video calls as well if, if, you, if you'd rather that, and we'll make sure you speak to the same counsellor again if it's or, or doctor if it's the same uh, if it's more than one call to the service. So these services are completely free, uh, confidential, and it doesn't matter uh, if you're a member or not, it's, it's open to everyone 24 seven. So yeah, if, if you're not currently a member, uh, there's not because I've been invited along today. Um, if, you, if you join using the link on, on the screen or the QR code on screen, uh, you'll get a 10 pound Amazon voucher. Uh, so this works for uh, first time joiners, also rejoiners, um, and you're free obviously to even join again. Uh, also, the rest of this month is completely free as well. So you, so you would only start paying from October. So you get the Amazon voucher and the rest of September free. Um, so yeah, it's, it's free for freshers, three pounds 16 for years to free. Three pound six six for uh, year groups above that, and then uh, nine pound seventy five a month uh, when you're in F one, but you get um, tax deduction all that, so it goes down to about seven pounds uh, twenty. And yeah, that's it for me. Um, just one last chance to, to sign up and receive the digital support pack um, using that QR code. Uh, the link's also there. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, try to keep it as quick as quick as possible. Um, but yeah, thanks thanks for listening, and, and I hope you use more of the sort of the BMA tools available to you guys. Thanks for having me. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dan. That was really useful. And if you guys aren't members of BMA already, I'm sure that talk will have convinced you why you should be. And like Dan said, excellent time to join because you get a £10 Amazon voucher. Um, and um, massive thank you to Ben as well, who did an excellent session today. Really, really useful. Um, so just to let you guys know that tomorrow's session will be on death verification. And then next week, the surgical session on Monday is going to be on gallstones. So make sure you join in. And like Ben said, make sure you fill out the feedback as well. Any questions, just either email us or post it in the comments and someone will check through them. Okay, thank you, everyone. And good night.